Edmund Aband is at the heart of the party's election campaign strategy. The Conservative Party. You can choose the economic chaos of Ed Miliband. Tories always thought he'd be one of their greatest assets. Because voters saw him as weak, too weird, not leadership material. Together with allies in the media, the Tories have relentlessly gone for the Labour leader. But with two weeks to go before voting, Ed Miliband sounds like a man who believes his fortunes are turning. I, I think... I think... I'm, I've turned out to be more resilient than some of my critics might have expected. And that's fine with me because people have tended to underestimate me. Paintings. Is that, um, I don't think they're all former chancellors. He got his first look at the Downing Street Garden 18 years ago, so the morning the after there. New Labour's landslide victory. And that's the, that's the alleged 11. Casing the joint at number 11 yeah. with his boss, Gordon Did Brown. He was now a special advisor in the Treasury, aged 28. It's only six hours since Labour's election victory party. Sunai worked for Gordon Brown and remembers the young Ed Miliband. The thing I most remember about him was, in those early days, was he had a strong belief in, in what he was trying to do. He'd come into politics, I think, to, to change the world. We talked to Sunai and she said uh, Ed wanted to change the world. Still do. It's quite a big project. I suppose it's kind of where how I was brought up, really. And I think if I wasn't in politics, I'm not sure what I'd be doing, but I'd be wanting to make the world a, a different and better place. That's not meant to sound like sort of Miss World. It's just sort of... Uh, I suppose it's a sort of... I've described it before as a faith. His regular Sunday observance away from Westminster has often been a lengthy afternoon discussion on political ideas with intellectual friends. They'd often start at his house round the corner from here in North London, adjourning to this restaurant. They'd chew over the future of the left. One of the participants said they sometimes went round in circles. Through his leadership, there have been these long Sunday afternoon sessions at the house, at the long. cafe round the corner. Yes. Chewing over ideas yes. Yes. about how to change the capitalist model. Uh, All sorts of things. And when the Syria debate was on, we were we were... He's very keen on getting people in who are experts who are exposed to ideas that perhaps in the heat of being a leader of a party you don't have time to look at. He's, but the thing I like about him is he's unashamed of getting people in who are proud of ideas, want to discuss ideas. I think ideas are the most undervalued commodity in British politics. Some of yeah, your critics say you sometimes get absorbed by the ideas, the big ideas too much, and you don't bring it down to practicality. I've had different criticisms, actually. Some people, you know, some people... You've heard that to, one before, though, haven't you? I've heard lots of them. Central you know, to his ideas is that say, capitalism must be reshaped, and now is the time to do it. Predators are just interested in the fast buck, taking what they can out of the business. Ed Miliband believes the public's ready for something more radical than Tony Blair and New Labour ever imagined. There's definitely that sense of that messianic sense in the Miliband entourage that there's something big has happened in 2008 and in the shadow of that crisis a more left-wing politics is suddenly possible. One of the things you announce just as you take over the uh, leadership of the Labour Party you, you talk about shaping the centre ground. Not, I presume, like Tony Blair working out where it is, parking your tent there, harvesting votes, but shaping it. Have you shaped it? I'll let others judge that. But I, what did you mean by it then? You could move it? Or it wasn't where we thought it was, yeah, the centre I think, ground? I th probably both of those things. I think, uh, I think political argument can change people's minds about what's right, what's wrong. And I think if you think about where the centre ground is on tax avoidance or whether we should be standing up to energy companies or reforming the banks, I think things are different than they were ten years ago. But has he cooked up a transformative offer? David Axelrod, the Obama strategist hired in for the election, has repeatedly told Ed Miliband privately to elevate his offer, stop with the palliatives. So at the end of all the intellectual agonising at this table and others, is Ed Miliband really offering the country something transformative or something much less drastic? Some people say that there's a good Ed and a bad Ed. These are people who are oh, quite close to I can't believe you. they say that. The good one is the radical transformative yeah. one. The bad one is the cautious ditherer who doesn't deliver I'm on sure the they so transformative that. policies. I'm afraid they do. OK, well, let me be, let me be uh, sort of answer that directly. Look, the reality is I think this, this is a, a, 
a project and a plan which I hope will lead to a country that looks different, significantly different at the end of five years of a Labour government. But I am also somebody who recognises that sort of grand rhetoric about transformation on day one will not convince people. There is a sort of Brownite tendency, which is to say there's a clear Olympian sense of what they want to do at a very high intellectual level, uh, described in abstractions such as social democracy and inequality. An idea that is just one simple word, together together. But sometimes that's hard to translate into the gritty realities of what do you actually do then, tomorrow, when you arrive in your department? What's the things we're going to get going? And I think that often you find, with both Ed Miliband and before him Gordon Brown, that though they could describe the shining city on the hill, the journey there is quite difficult to trace. People look at Gordon Brown's premiership and see a man who didn't, didn't seem to be at ease with the job, um, was always calling for more papers, let's have more discussions, not, didn't find decision making easy, and some people say, you're a chip off the old block. Let them make the choice. I mean, let them make, let them take their view. Um, well, what lessons did you different. learn from the way he Everyone, did every, the job? Every, every person is different. Look, every person and every leader is different. Look, look, judge me on what I've done as leader of the opposition and my plan for the future. And I think what you see is somebody who has taken some pretty big calls on Rupert Murdoch on phone hacking, on the energy companies, on the banks. This is a cheesy choice. Okay. It's take on me by heart, and I can hear people sort of screaming at their radios. You're a brave one. But the big ideas man has been held back by a giant image problem. Voters aren't sure they want to take up his offer to serve as their national leader. In the election campaign, he's been eyeballing the voters. I think people at home, but there's a bigger issue for people at home. Be honest with people at home. Getting you used to the idea of him as Prime Minister. And they'll be my priorities as Prime Minister. If I'm elected as Prime Minister... ..trying to kill off the Ed Miliband problem. Hell yes, I'm tough enough. You see him engaging with, with people. You see a completely different side of him. You see the side that I've seen for 20 years. The self-deprecating humour. He can take the mickey out of himself. There were two young women who were in the park and they seemed excited to see me and they, and they came over. And uh, it's not that funny. Uh, <laughs> I've never met anyone in politics who is more prepared to invite people to ask what, can be, what could be improved in his performance and, uh, and the things he does as leader. I'm very, it's, it's, it's something that everyone who knows him uh, is struck by. But he is very, very thick-skinned about it. And so when he says that uh, he, these things don't get to him, I'm not sure it was always that way, but I think he has definitely become someone who has learnt to have a very thick skin about them. He's made some headway in this campaign, but the doubts persist. So do the attacks and the rebuttals. It's right that I've been tested. Tested for the extraordinary privilege of leading this country. I'm ready. I'm ready. You said, I'm ready. Is that just recently you've become ready? <laughs> just now? Lucky there wasn't an early election. When, when did you become ready? Well, I know, I genuinely uh, wondered about the phrase, because some people in the past have said that you you haven't always been quite as resilient as maybe you appear now. Not always as buoyant. Sometimes sagging in confidence, sometimes a little inward looking doesn't really as sound, leader. Doesn't really sound like me. Um, look, I, I suppose it's a process of... I suppose what I really meant was we've put in place a programme. I've been tested in this job. I, I, I passionately believe this country's got to change. I passionately believe that we can do a lot better than this as a country. The country can be run in a different way, and people have to make their choice. He beat his brother to the leadership of his party, saying there was another way to win elections. You didn't have to do it Tony Blair's way. With the added complications of a fractured political market and a fractured United Kingdom, he's about to put that to the test. 